I'm super excited to bring Chris Munns onto the stage next. Chris Munns is the business development manager of DevOps at Amazon Web Services. He works with companies of all sizes to help them understand how DevOps can transform how they do development. Typically, it involves giving developers and operations engineers foam bats and letting them battle to the death. As Chris says, two groups enter, one group leaves. Please welcome Chris to the stage. Thank you, Seth. Hi, everyone. Uh, you'll find the foam bats located under your seats. Um, be gentle to those in the vicinity around you. Um, thank you for coming to the session. Uh, thank you to everyone at HashiCon for having me. Uh, it's been a fantastic two days here. Uh, it's hard to go as the last session in a, a two-day talk like this. It's kind of akin to going on stage at a comedy festival like directly after Louis C.K. And my only joke is, I just flew into Portland and boy, my arm's tired. So a lot of hard acts to follow from this week. Uh, so Seth said, my name's Chris Munns. I'm the business development manager of DevOps at AWS. Um, I work with our customers across the whole wide spectrum of uh, sizes and industries to understand how DevOps can help uh, impact their business in a positive way, change how they use, do development, um, what tools matter, how the culture matters, and things like that. Um, and I've had a number of other roles. I worked in operations places, things like Etsy and Meetup. Um, it was a former solutions architect at AWS as well. So when it came to trying to think of what to talk about here at HashiConf, uh, something that I've been spending a lot of time with uh, customers of AWS is talking about lately has been microservices. And I was curious in an audience like this just how big of a deal it would be to talk about microservices. Right, something that we're seeing much more uh, apparent across actually everyone from enterprises to startups today. And I figured that this is probably a good cross-section of the industry, given the different types of attendees that you have here today, to, to understand you know, who's going to be talking about microservices. And while there were many talks this week that touched a little bit on it, there weren't too many that talked directly about it. I have to say that I did have a whole bunch of slide content in my deck talking a little bit more about microservices and trying to back up the, the reasons behind them and for them. And then luckily for me, uh, Mitchell got on stage yesterday and said microservices are the future. And so that let me actually get rid of a whole bunch of content. Um, so thank you to, to Mitchell for that. So a brief agenda, uh, talking about microservices, uh, the parts that are crossed out here, I, I don't need to cover as much, thankfully. Um, and talking about how microservices I feel and, and I see in the industry very much is the future in terms of an architectural paradigm. Uh, where to start if you do start, and then uh, some different methodologies for deploying microservices today. So uh, defining microservices, I always like to start with a definition if I'm talking about something. This is taken from Wikipedia. It talks about it being a software architecture style in which complex applications composed of small independent processes communicating with each other over language agnostic APIs, so on and so forth. Uh, highlighting the fact that they are, or should be, small, highly decoupled, focused on doing a single small task, and facilitating a modular approach to system building. And so there's a lot of people talking about microservices right now, as I mentioned. There's actually a really fantastic book by Stan Newman, The Name, Building Microservices. Actually, really great read. Uh, if you haven't picked up a copy of that, I recommend that you do. Adrian Crocker, formerly of Netflix, has been talking about this now for a good couple of years, actually, about how Netflix has built this you know, many, many, many service architecture to support their infrastructure. And then lastly, uh, Martin Fowler of uh, ThoughtWorks talks about this extensively from many different angles. Uh, numerous blog posts contributed to a number of books, not directly on the topic necessarily of microservices, but in a lot of supporting concepts around there. And then lastly, at reInvent last year, we had two sessions about microservices. This year, next week in Vegas, we have at least eight that I know of. So just kind of highlighting a little bit the growth of microservices. So uh, recently, there was a really great blog post by Phil Cacato, who is from SoundCloud, talking about the transition that they made from a monolithic architecture to microservices. And one of the bits that I found that was really, really interesting was he pulled up this graph from Google Trends showing kind of the incredibly rapid growth of the term microtrends over the last period of time that he had here. Um, and so I thought this was an interesting point to kind of dive into. So if we, like following shows like CSI, we say enhance and zoom in on this data here, we see that the term microservices really didn't exist much before March 2014. So it's kind of an, an interesting aspect about this. But then we've seen a really pretty steady rate of growth across this. 
So when we talk about microservices, though, there are a lot of people who say, well, this is just rebranded service-oriented architecture, right? We've been down this road before. SOA existed since the 90s. What is it that makes microservices so different from that? Again, talking, reading about what various different people in different places say about this, and you can find just tons and tons and tons of comparisons out there. Uh, Wikipedia, actually, in the definition for microservices, says that uh, what makes microservices distinct from SOA is that whereas SOA is integrating various business applications, uh, microservices is, taking, is basically saying that several microservices belong to one application only. And I don't necessarily agree with that paradigm. Uh, Mountain Faller says that the common manifestation of SOA has led some microservice advocates to reject the SOA label entirely, although saying others consider microservices to be a form of it. It's not really helping to give us a good idea of how the two compare. And then lastly, and oddly enough, Oracle had a blog post about the architectural paradigm of microservices and said that it's not an alternative SOA, but effectively kind of the, the next generation of what SOA is. So going back and thinking about, okay, well, how else can I compare the two? I went back to Google Trends and popped in service-oriented architecture versus microservices. And so what we see here is that there really hasn't been much of a dent made by microservices in people that are interested in SOA. There's been a nice little kind of tail down about it, but if we were to compare kind of where the peak of microservices is to where SOA is today, it's three to four times as much people, or however Google measures trends, talking about SOA versus microservices. So I thought, what kind of other things could I find that could potentially correlate and give reason to why there's been this explosion in microservices? So I searched through a bunch of terms, and fortunately these are some of the slides that I pulled out of this deck. Uh, two key important terms, DevOps and Lean Startups, both of them didn't seem to have any correlation to microservices. They've existed several years before. Um, and while they both have had their own kind of rapid growth, doesn't seem to directly correlate either. So I thought, I know. I know exactly the term that will correlate to microservices, containers. Unfortunately, the word containers is a little too vague in Google Trends, and it wasn't easy to really find a direct mapping of the term there. However, Docker, I thought, well, that should be an easy thing to look. So Docker, the software um, technology, has its own category in Google Trends. And so this is comparing that, the red there being Docker, the blue being microservices. But unfortunately, the data isn't super clean either. Um, because as we can see, Docker, which was released in March of 2013, we've got this kind of tail before that, and it looks like the problem here is that the Docker that was talked about before this time is typically the kind that you wear on your legs, so Dockers. So I uh, basically struggled to find any sort of term that directly correlated it with this. So what was the thing that really kicked off microservices becoming a concept and a term that we were following? And actually, I think I dug back, and the first person who ever used the term microservices used it back sometime between 2005 and 2010, so long before this trend of this word ever existed. But given all that, there are actually lots of smart companies that are doing microservices today at large scale. So we have Gilt, Nike, SoundCloud, Capital One, Halo, just as an example of companies that are doing very large scale microservices and talking about it very actively. And you could find links to the posts and presentations that they've done here. As well as that, there are some really large technology companies that have been releasing their own tools, you know, open source, for managing microservices. So you have Netflix, Airbnb, Twitter, LinkedIn. They've all been releasing tools to help them manage their microservice infrastructure that they've built up over the years. And many of these are tools that many of you are potentially using today, uh, namely things like Mesos from Twitter, which is very, very tightly correlated with the, the Docker ecosystem. Uh, at Amazon, we've been part of the trend as well for a number of years. So once upon a time, uh, Amazon.com was a monolith-based Perl application, uh, if you want to imagine that. Uh, and then in 2001, we began the process of splitting up the monolith into various components. And the Death Star that you see over here on the far side is taken from 2009, where we showed how all the various services that we had inside of Amazon at that point uh, were basically connected to each other. So this is several hundred services just back in 2009 across all of Amazon. And we follow a model that many people have heard the term of that we kind of define, which is the concept of two pizza teams. Anytime you meet an employee from Amazon, they are part of a two pizza team. And effectively what this means is we say that the idea behind this is that a team should be no bigger than that which would have to be fed by two pizzas. There's an asterisk by that, given that some people could eat two pizzas themselves, and we wouldn't want them to be a one-person team. Um, but basically, it's, it's a structure of somewhere between six to ten people, usually, is a two-pizza team. And so two-pizza teams at Amazon are usually focused around a single purpose, 
usually managing just a single service, um, API-based over HTTP that we call primitives. And so if you think of a service like EC2 or S3, it's actually composed of many, many, many sub-primitives that enable it to be a service that you guys get to consume yourselves. And this tradition lives on today. If we were to look at the Death Star from 2015 of services and how they correlate, it would be probably several magnitudes the size of the one that we have here. So microservices, probably not a fad, right? This is something that a lot of companies are spending a lot of time on. There's a lot of tooling. We learned about some awesome things that came out uh, announced this week from HashiCorp in the vein kind of of that. So this is something that's definitely here and that we should definitely pay attention to. So, okay, so we've established that this is a real thing. How do we go about doing microservices? Uh, so first, it's important to understand, do you, should you even do microservices? Does it fit you and your business and, and you know, what your infrastructure needs are? If you are, then what I usually recommend is kind of a two-phased approach, with the first one being to actually establish rules around the pattern for services and clients, then work on the actual infrastructure components. So kind of lay down some rules and policies for how you're going to build things and then build things versus kind of following the inverse of that, which is build stuff and figure it out later. Um, and when you're talking about microservices, this is an important thing. So when we talk about microservices, we usually talk about it in the vein of tearing down the monolith, right? Tearing down the one large uh, application that we have inside of our business that reigns supreme and that is usually typically most of, if not the core product that we have. And so there are a lot of reasons why you would want to do this. Organizationally, there's a, there's a number of uh, drivers to moving towards microservices. In Phil from SoundCloud's post that he put out a couple weeks ago, he had a really great diagram, actually the first time I've ever seen this broken out this way, where he talked about the comparison between developer work and then the handoff between various cycles in the development process. So going from uh, you know, a product being talked about to it being designed, to it being coded, to Q&A, to more testing, to prod, and all the different time that was involved inside of it. So when SoundCloud was a monolith, the problem that they had is that development time could take maybe just a number of days, but the handoff period could sometimes take multiples of that, so two to three times the period that it took for development. And so it was because there was all this kind of heavy process and work in the middle of it. So if you find that your development coordination time is several times greater than your development time, it's a good reason to move to microservices. Another is if the monolith is actually blocking technologies that would benefit the business. So, you know, over at least more than the last five years now, a number of companies have moved to things like non-relational databases. If you have maybe an old school monolith, you might be blocked by doing this. Right? Imagine that you have a table that is very important to your data set, something like a, a profiles table. And it becomes a very difficult thing to move out of a monolith without potentially breaking various different components inside of it. So this could eventually kind of effectively hold you back from being able to move outside of uh, you know, certain use cases and certain technologies. And then lastly, one of the biggest problems I think with the monolith is around accountability and ownership. When you have a large monolith and you have a very large development team, people who may have come and gone over the years, people who have worked on various overlapping, overlapping concepts and, and overlapping parts of the code base, you have a difficulty in finding out who really owns this and who's responsible for fixing and improving things. So again, a number of organizational reasons why you might want to move to microservices. From technological reasons, pretty straightforward. Does part of the monolith or a single subcomponent of the monolith greatly outweigh the rest of the subservices or parts of your infrastructure? You know, take for instance a e-commerce site where you've got listings and carts and searches and feedback and order processing and all of these things, if one component is representational of a mass of the code base, of a mass of the performance and scaling of your infrastructure, that probably means you have a very outweighed uh, monolith. And so microservices might make sense. And lastly, kind of similar to the organizational concept here, is, is there something in your technology that is effectively blocking you from being able to uh, you know, move towards new directions, add new features? Right? You could be blocked from adding new features based on feature debt that you have in another part of the code base. So again, organizational and technological reasons why you might want to move to microservices. However, there is an inverse to this. Right? So microservices do come with a number of things that you have to think about. Uh, organizationally, one thing that I find when I'm working with startup companies that want to move to microservices from day one is that it can actually be a really bad experience for them. If you have the issue where you have a very small development team and you start moving into a model where you could have many, many, many microservices per, per developer, you could actually run into the inverse of what Phil saw at uh, SoundCloud, 
which is that the coordination time could become so heavy because of the number of services you have that it could block development across others. Also, if you have, say, certain, development, uh, certain developers on the team who are responsible for certain core microservices, the amount of accountability and ownership that they have to take compared to others in the team or in the company could be really out of balance. So imagine that you have you know, two people that own your checkout process. They want to go on vacation. Right? What happens? That could become a problem. From the technological reasons, uh, you know, card, uh, code reuse, a big thing. Right? When you're a small development team or you're a small shop, being able to reuse code, being able to share modules becomes very different in a microservices environment. Um, Another big thing here is monitoring metrics, logging, and alerting. Uh, these are things that people don't do well in a monolith. They sometimes do it way worse in microservices. So if you don't have uh, you know, a very good, rigid foundation in these things, you're going to struggle even further when it comes to microservices. And then lastly, for many companies, they really don't need to, to do this because they haven't reached a point where the scale is actually too much for them to handle. Uh, I've talked to a number of companies where they say, oh, you know, we wrote this in PHP. We need to refactor to go. I say, why? Well, because we're running into XYZ scaling challenge. I say, well, have you tried a larger instance? Uh, have you tried you know, maybe just tweaking this thing this way? And often there are a lot of low-hanging fruit that you could find when it comes to performance tuning that could buy you, you know, quite a long ramp of time before you would ever need to think about refactoring. Generally, I say for about 90% of the companies that I talk to, if you think that you need to refactor, you've probably missed something really, really basic in terms of scaling your infrastructure. So it's easy to get excited about microservices, but again, many people actually don't need them unless they're running into the challenges that I mentioned before. So let's say that you are one of the people who are running into the challenges involved, um, and you are going to go the route of moving to microservices. I mentioned before that one thing that you want to do before you actually start diving in and pulling apart your monolith is to establish a pattern for the services and the clients that you're building. And actually, Sam Newman's book does a really great job of breaking this down and talking about some of the various things that you want to think about, like the protocol, how you're going to talk over the wire, um, security aspects, and the, lots of different things there. So I think that there's at least five things that you want to try to answer before you start working towards building into microservices. The first is, how are the clients going to communicate to your services and to each other? Right? How are they going to talk on the wire? It's really good to try to establish a pattern, if you can, for this. Now, what kind of cross-service authorization do you have? Right? How many people actually are building cross-authorization to their microservices? This is actually a very important thing from a security perspective to stay on top of, uh, you know, prevent abuse and things like that. Which brings me to my next point is how do services prevent abuse? Um, it's very common when you work in microservices and you're dealing with HTTP-based uh, protocols that you could potentially DDoS certain microservices inside of your infrastructure based on scaling requirements of other parts. So how do you prevent that from happening? How do you quickly build clients against the service? Right? If you have very rapid development and you're doing CI and CD really well, or your microservices are continually evolving, how do you keep the clients up with that? And then lastly, how do you handle service discovery? And because we are at the conference that we're at, this is the point of the talk where I will spend the least amount of time. So uh, the first bit of advice that I have if you're going to build microservices in any way, shape, or form is to use an API gateway. And this is not just because AWS has an API gateway service, even though it's really awesome, but because API gateways provide for you a number of benefits and a number of kind of constraints that actually push you towards good practices. So at AWS this past July, we released our uh, Amazon API gateway service. Um, this is a, a managed service for you that provides an, an API gateway that does a number of really good things for you. So it allows you to host multiple versions and stages of your APIs. It allows you to create and distribute API keys to developers or to your, your internal clients. It allows you to do things like throttling requests as well as doing things like caching requests. So preventing abuse and preventing kind of overuse of some of your services. It can do transformation of requests. So if you have like an old monolith and you want to break it up piece by piece and maybe you have some wire protocol that talks XML and you want to change that into JSON, you can do that. You can also integrate with CloudFront. So let's say that you have a mobile app that you want to talk to your API. You can go and uh, put CloudFront in front of API Gateway to help with latency and, and DDoS. And then the last two points are really, really important from a development perspective, Swagger support and then SDK generation. And, and really, these last two points are key things in enabling you to much, much, much more easily build clients inside of your organization. So let's actually like pause real quick and talk about what that workflow might look like. 
So I'm a developer. I'm writing a backend service or a service inside of my microservices environment. And I've written my code and I've used Swagger to spec out my API. I can take that Swagger uh, manifest of my API, send it on into API Gateway, and configure my API Gateway for my version of my code. From there, I can then generate an SDK in a number of different languages, iOS, Android, uh, JavaScript, things like that. And I can take that SDK, bundle it as an NPM, take that NPM, put it into a private repo, and then make this available for the other developers inside my organization to build their services against. So again, all I've done is basically written my code and maybe generated Swagger from it and sent it in to process this. And then you could very easily automate the whole rest of this workflow. Okay, so we've got version 1.1.1 here. And if you follow semantic versioning, you, know, you do minor updates, you do minor updates, no big deal. But at some point you want to do a major version change and you need to put out a new version of your SDK. So what we can do is stand up a new API gateway um, stage and version and go through the same process, right? Pass in Swagger into the API gateway, generate an SDK, generate an NPM, put that into a repo, and then all of my new clients or clients that need that expanded functionality can start to use it. If we're doing smart things internally in our organization, like tracking dependencies inside of our code, uh, actually Versionize is a really cool tool to do this. You can point it at your private um, modules and have code bases track them based on dependencies and then do things like alert and email you. So we can actually do smart things like notifying other developers in my organization, hey, there's a new version of the blah, blah, blah service. Here's a link to find out more. And then at some point, basically, you, you know, deprecate the old API, make sure that everyone's off of it, and then terminate it. So a really cool thing that you can do, uh, you can do this with just raw swagger, um, but an API gateway makes it really easy. And if you're someone who is, for some crazy reason, not on AWS, um, there's actually a really great open source uh, API gateway called Kong from the really awesome people at Mashape. Offers a lot of the same kind of capabilities. Um, and they actually have pre-built AMIs and uh, Vagrant images for you to install with this. So a really cool, uh, you know, necessary component if you're going to do microservices. So going back to our list of five things we need to think about, we've actually managed to just kill off four of them just by using an API gateway. And so if we standardize this for every service that we built inside of our infrastructure, we can remove these concerns from being part of any of the application building that we're doing, right? Make it a point where that every new developer that spins up a new microservice follows this paradigm and follows these patterns, and you'll be able to really, really, really rapidly turn out microservices. So the last point here, right? How do we handle service discovery and um, registry of other services? So again, we're at HashiConf. There's a fantastic tool that they've built called Console which there's no way that I could uh, do it enough honor in the time that I have here to talk about it. Um, but you can integrate console with your microservices, right? Use it for registry of your endpoints, discovery via DNS or HTTP, do health checking, uh, do key value store for things like configuration, feature flagging, and so forth. So a really smart and good way to, to integrate your microservices together. And so between these two things, we can take care of five really big concerns that we have in how we design and build our services and our clients. So good. So from our list of you decided that we are going to do microservices, and then we've again taken care of this first thing. The next thing is taking, thinking about how we're going to deploy our microservices. So there's a couple models that people are probably really, really familiar with here. There is the uh, way of using Amazon EC2 instances as kind of a unit of deployment. So whether you're deploying a whole AMI or you're doing in-place code deployments. And then lastly, containers, or next I should say it's containers. So we'll talk about each of these a little bit here. So the first one, deploying microservices on Amazon EC2, really pretty straightforward, something that I think probably everyone who's operated in a cloud environment for the last couple of years will understand. Um, some, some kind of points of recommendation here. Um, single services per host, I think, is key. Anytime that I find that people are doing multiple services on a single host where there's not containers involved, they're, they're running into all sorts of nasty scaling challenges and problems there. Um, start with small instance sizes. This is another thing that I'm always very surprised about. Um, people tend to really oversize their instances without knowing that they need to do it. A customer of mine that I'm working with that has a large microservices environment, several hundred microservices, they actually run a majority of them on the T2 instance class, so the, the smallest instance class that's available. Typically, each service has somewhere between two and six instances for it. So 
a whole lot of really small instances for all their microservices as a really cost-effective way of running microservices at scale. Leverage things like auto-scaling and, and ELB. I think that's kind of a, a, a pretty straightforward concept here. If you're going to deal with scaling these services, you don't want to have to deal with manually scaling them yourself over time. And then lastly, like really automate the ability to pump out these things. So I talked about how standardizing on an API gateway and something like a registry service like console makes sense. But you also want to make it really, really, really easy for your developers to quickly stand up environments that meet the constraints and kind of the patterns that you're going to decide upon. Uh, we have another service called Service Catalog that I don't get to at all in this talk, but actually, effectively, it's a service that we have uh, in the console. You can go and create predefined environments. So imagine that you have a predefined standard for a microservice, and your developers can go and just pop those things out like crazy uh, based on those standards without having to build things. You can obviously use awesome things like Terraform to do this as well. So when it comes to actually getting your code out there in this infrastructure, Again, two methods that I see as being the really most popular ways of doing it. One is AMI bundling. Uh, you write your code, you bundle it into an AMI, you launch that AMI into a new instance, and then typically you're, you're putting that behind an ELP, either an existing one or building out a new one and directing DNS over to that. And so that's kind of the two ways people would call that blue-green or red-black. Uh, but pretty, pretty tried and true, lots of different tools and, and existing patterns and people who do this. Um, you could use awesome tools like Packer to build those AMIs really, really rapidly as part of a, a CI and CD process, and then deploy them out there. If you're someone who likes to maintain kind of a, a constant fleet of instances, you don't want to be, say, taking your hosts and churning them all the time, uh, we have a service called Code Deploy, which can also make this really, really easy for you. So Code Deploy based off of an internal service that we had at Amazon uh, called Apollo. And what it does is it allows you to treat a group of hosts as a fleet, there's an agent that runs there, and you can use this to coordinate you know, installation of things like you know, RPMs or tarballs or other sorts of packages that you would want to install on a host. So deploying microservices on EC2 instances, again, a very tried and true pattern, something that a lot of people have seen before at scale, right? not just in the microservices sense, but in the large scale monolithic sense. Um, so there's lots of tooling and pattern for there, lots of workflows that support it, lots of tools that support it. And it's very easy to take a monolith and model, at least operationally, the patterns for building this quickly. But there's still some kind of questions and concerns that we have, right? We don't touch upon this at all in this talk, but how do you keep environments in check, right? How are you dealing with the difference between dev, stage, and prod? Uh, kind of a, a traditional issue that people have over time. Um, does anything about this make developers' lives easier? Not a whole lot, unless we really automate the full process for them and give them you know, very simple tools to deploy things. Does anything about this make operations' lives easier? Absolutely not, right? The more instances you have to manage, the more overhead there is. No matter what tools you have, no matter what your factor is of host to operations or DevOps people, the more that you have, the more overhead all the time. And then lastly, what kind of sprawl can we see with this? So when we have a single service, there's not that much going on. When we have a little over a dozen services, well, it starts to get a little busier. When we have several dozen services, it becomes quite chaotic. Right? So the EC2 methodology here of, of deploying this way can be quite a lot of operational overhead. So we move past EC2, and we talk about containers. Um, again, something that I fortunately don't have enough time to dive into in enough depth today. Containers wildly, wildly, wildly popular these days. Uh, we saw kind of the trend shooting up uh, before the microservices trend did. Um, so some advice for writing microservices with containers. Uh, in this case, you do want to put, typically, multiple services per host, the inverse of what you'd want to do if you're just deploying with raw EC2. And in this case, you also potentially do want to make use of larger instance types, right? You have the ability, then, to have a larger homogeneous fleet, more CPU, more RAM, more services on it, a little bit less operational overhead at scale. Uh, you know, general advice is to run helper services on the same host, and then you can use tools like console, for instance, to point those services at each other. So that's a, a pretty cool thing. And then make use of a container management framework that reduces operational burden. Uh, there are a number of container management frameworks out there that I find have more pieces than the people are actually running it on there for their own business. And so if you're running into a situation where you're spending more time managing your container management infrastructure than your actual services infrastructure, you probably want to revisit the tool that you're using. Uh, AWS, we have our EC2 container service that we launched uh, last November at reInvent, uh, supports the, you know, Docker containers, kind of gives you a, a, a wrapper for doing Docker on top of EC2, uh, integrating with EBS and ELB and IAM and a number of other things. So a good way to get started with, uh, with running containers at scale. 
So even though we've simplified things, right? Maybe we've got fewer hosts, we're running multiple services, uh, containers are, are really easy to move things. Um, so we've simplified our developer workflow. Uh, we can then drastically improve scaling time, right? Launching hundreds of Docker containers at once is actually nowhere near the challenge that launching hundreds of instances at once could be. You have portability improvements and the ability to increase utilization of resources, but there's still a number of downsides to containers. Um, schedulers, right? Schedulers are kind of crazy things. Um, uh, Nomad looks really awesome, for sure. Uh, but some of the other containers are, are really complicated pieces of software, right? How many people are running containers today understand what their scheduler is doing in depth? Not many people that I talk to. Uh, are you effectively managing system resources? So one sometimes I see people have a cluster way too big, way too spread out, and the utilization rate could be incredibly low. So they're spending way too much money for running microservices you know, per service. Uh, the third bullet point here is, is one of my biggest pet peeves with containers. I call it container bloat. And this is when I, I work with people that are you know, customers who are using containers, and they're shipping containers that are in the multiple gigabytes of size. I find this to be really a slap in the face of the direction that containers were supposed to provide, which was supposed to be this kind of you know, light layer that sits above an OS and a, above a container management system. If you're bundling in so many requirements into your containers that you're now in the multiple gigabyte size for a container image, then you're, you're not doing containers the way that it was intended. And then lastly, there are a lot of people who question, is the ecosystem too young? Right? So there are a lot of things about containers that are very new. Metrics and monitoring and logging tools are still very new. Um, you know, depending on how evolved your organization is, you could find that containers just aren't ready for you yet. Going back to our sprawl diagram here, right? with containers, we could still have dozens, if not hundreds, of EC2 instances that we have to manage with a container service on top of it, with our containers on top of it, behind you know, load balancers and API gateways and all of that. So potentially still quite a lot of things for us to operationally manage. So if we look at these two methodologies and think to ourselves, well, what, what are kind of some of the common themes here? What are some of the unaddressed management issues that we have? A uh, big one is that we're still managing the actual EC2 instances, right? So we still, at the end of the day, haven't done that much to remove that burden. Containers go a really far away, right? If you're using a really large EC2 instance, you can have you know, maybe even a dozen containers on it. That does reduce operational burden, but you still have to deal with that operational burden. Things like OS patches, host security, host resource management, scaling policy tweaks, right? Are you growing that cluster? Are you shrinking it all the time? How does that work out for you? Still have to deal with redundancy, failover, resiliency. Um, and between like development, prod, and staging, and stuff like that, you could still have drift. So the solution here, or the problem we have here is still we potentially have too many servers to manage for a small organization when you're doing microservices. So I'm going to talk about a potential solution to that problem. So Werner Vogel, CTO of Amazon, has a, a, a phrase that he likes to say, which is that no server is easier to manage than no server. So at AWS last year, November at reInvent, we launched AWS Lambda, which is a service that runs your code in response to events and automatically manages the compute resources for you. You do no management of EC2 when you're using Lambda. It takes care of capacity, scaling, deployment, monitoring, logging, uh, has a web services front end, has security patching built in, the fact that you're not dealing with the EC2 instance. One of the other great things about it, again, is that it completely handles scaling. Whether you have one request a second, 10, 50, 100, 1,000, Lambda will be able to deliver those request executions for you without you having to crank a knob, pre-provision, or do anything ahead of time in terms of running or, or pre-configuring your infrastructure to handle that potential scale. The other benefit to that is that you only pay for what you use. Right? You never have to worry about being over-provisioned, under-provisioned. You basically just pay exactly for the requests that get executed. So uh, we first launched Lambda. We had a couple of different ways that you can talk to it. And then in the last 11 months or so, we've expanded that pretty drastically. So one of the first use cases that we had was the ability to, we added actually a feature in S3 called S3 notifications. So you can use S3 notifications. So I, I upload an object to S3. Let's say it's a photo. It hits S3, S3 generates a notification, sends it to Lambda. Lambda then is, is, is running code for me, right? So I upload my code, today we support Node.js or Java. I can integrate something like ImageMagic or any other system utility that I want. 
grab that image, maybe I want to resize it into a number of different sizes for say mobile devices and tablets and stuff like that. I can then take those resized images, shoot them back into S3, and then maybe update metadata someplace in Dynamo. And in this situation here, I don't have a single server that I'm managing. Everything is taken care of for me. Another cool thing that you can do with it is that you could point SNS at Lambda, so simple notification service. So CloudWatch, our metrics and monitoring, and now logging centralization service, you can have uh, triggers and alerts that get sent to SNS, and then SNS can trigger a Lambda function. So in reaction to any sort of you know, alert that you have in CloudWatch, you can now actually take immediate action to that alert to help resolve it. So there's a number of operational things that you can do in doing this. We later added integration with Kinesis and DynamoDB. So with Kinesis, our uh, you know, very, very large scale, high throughput real-time streaming service, you can actually have Kinesis events as they come through kick off Lambda functions for you. So let's say that I'm collecting uh, maybe actions off of mobile devices from my users. I want to do some real-time analytics on it. I can gather all these things and have Lambda actually in real time execute code about these and then do something. Maybe I want to toss logs into CloudWatch. Maybe I want to send messages or do something with SNS. Then we added the capability for you to tie it in with Simple Workflow. So Simple Workflow is kind of a business logic orchestration service. Uh, and it used to be that you would have to run a pool of EC2 instances that would run workers that would pull Simple Workflow looking for work. Now Simple Workflow can actually just send those tasks right to Lambda. Again, no need to manage EC2, no need to manage Simple Workflow. This is, again, another completely serverless environment for you. And then as recently as yesterday, we announced the ability for Simple Email Service to support inbound email uh, rules and policies. So now what you can do is you can point an entire email domain or single addresses at SES for it to receive it. And then based on rules, it can actually kick off a Lambda call. So maybe I want to automatically reply to certain emails. I want to maybe read something about those emails and reply to them. Uh, I want to scan, scan them for viruses. There's a number of things that we can do. And then Lambda can be used as logic. Again, I'm not managing an email server. I don't have to worry about Exchange or anything like that. I don't run the processing backend on this. This is all a completely serverless infrastructure. And then lastly, API Gateway, when it was launched, launched with the capability for you to point individual API paths at Lambda. So this is a screenshot from an example that we have called squirrelbin.com. You can actually go to that, uh, that URL that's over there on the, the top uh, right here um, and see it. And what squirrelbin.com represents is a web application that is completely serverless. It is the web front end written in JavaScript that lives in S3 that you access uh, via your browser. And then the JavaScript browser client talks to API Gateway, which talks to Lambda. And then based on the calls that you're making, it executes different Lambda functions, depending on what it is that you're doing. And then those Lambda functions have the ability to talk to DynamoDB. So we, it's a very, very basic example that we show. But you can imagine how you could extrapolate this and do so much more with it. And again, not a single, single server, not a single bit of administration overhead that you would typically deal with from microservices is involved in this. This is a completely serverless-based, API-based uh, web application. There's other benefits to using something like Lambda. So when we talk about lines of code inside of a service, um, when we talk about typically a monolith, you've got potentially tens of thousands to maybe even millions at a large scale of lines of code. As you break that down into microservices and get some kind of benefits and agility there, you might find that that is in the hundreds to maybe single thousands of lines of code. But Lambda functions actually typically we see are in the tens to hundreds of lines of code. So the previous example for Squirrelbin is actually 150 lines of Node.js. That is the back end for that entire website. And so when you're thinking about what this means to you development-wise and the agility that you could have in, in doing microservices at what I like to call the nano scale, and, you know, imagine testing code where all you have to test is a couple hundred lines. Right? Writing the unit tests for that should be ridiculously easy. When new developers come in, they don't have to read a long, complicated code base. They can see, OK, this is this function. This is everything that's involved in this function. And here's how I can understand what's going on here. And then lastly, it leads to really, really super fast deployments. Right? We're not pushing around multi-gig Docker containers. We're not pushing around complicated binaries or deploying AMIs. We can take our code, bundle it up, and toss it into Lambda. And actually, that's exactly what the deployment workflow looks like. So an example here is we can write Lambda. 
commit it to GitHub, have it kick off a CI run, do normal you know, CI unit integration tests, output that to S3 as a tarball, use S3 event notifications to kick off a Lambda function, to deploy our Lambda function, and then configure our API gateway. And effectively here you have a completely serverless, if, if you use you know, perhaps third-party SaaS offerings like Travis or CircleCI or CodeShip, completely serverless way of deploying your code out to the real world. So going back to our kind of diagram of many, many microservices, we could have an environment where we could have tens if not hundreds of microservices and with Lambda and API Gateway still not have a single server to manage, right? No configuration management we need to worry about. Um, you could still use things like console. So you could still actually have something like console running for cross service, uh, cross microservice discovery registry. But the actual services themselves, whether they're getting, again, 1, 10, 100, 1,000 requests per second, you never have to manage the scale for that. So a Lambda, again, really straightforward. You deploy your Lambda functions, configure the event source or API gateway. You can monitor what's going on with them with CloudWatch logs and graphs, which is integrated with Lambda. And that's kind of it from administration, right? No patch management, no scaling management, no resource management. So in closing, and my apologies for having to go really, really fast here. I wish I could talk about this for, for an entire day. Uh, microservices are a very real pattern. Uh, again, we're seeing them at scale at a lot of organizations. Uh, maybe you yourself are at a very large organization that could compare to some of those that are doing it. It might mean that it's a good practice for you. Again, think about the pros and the cons. If you're gonna go the route of microservices, define your service and client standards early on. Don't grow into them. Think about them a little bit ahead of time based on what other people are doing and adapt those, or adopt those, I should say. And again, use an API gateway. There are so many things that an API gateway does for you that otherwise you'd be building into your own code. Pick a deployment methodology and go with it. Um, again, uh, I often hear people talk about picking you know, best of breed technologies for different things. I actually disagree with it. I think you should pick one standard and attempt to standardize on it for a majority of what you do, and then very carefully calculate if you're going to move to something different. And then lastly and most importantly, automate everything, right? If you're doing something by hand to deploy something, then you're probably doing it wrong. So with that, thank you guys for your time. Hopefully you've found this useful and learned something new. Please check out Lambda. It's a really awesome service and uh, it, it'll change the way that you think about deploying and running code. Thanks. <laughs>